so let's talk about latest and some old news uh, first one i think this is the biggest one this is the headline story that is the ukrainian drone strike on kremlin there was a drone strike on kremlin recently drones drone was downed with no victims or material damage to the kremlin it was said to be rigged with canadian bombs and stopped by electronic warfare systems which disabled the drones before they could reach their target ukraine denied any involvement but days before a ukrainian oligarch volodymyr yatsenko offered 549000 for anyone who committed drone terror in russia's red square ahead of the country's victory day parade zelensky around the time of attack after the attack wasn't in ukraine possibilities of attack failure of russian air defense possible it is possible that russian air defense failed and drone traveled all the way from ukraine to the kremlin in moscow um i don't know if that is true but if it is true but if it is true then it's embarrassing honestly because you couldn't just intercept the drone at the border and anywhere in between you had to intercept it right before it landed on the kremlin dome it seems embarrassing second one attack from inside russia it seems possible uh I don't know if uh, I don't know what kind of drone it was. Uh, it's already hard to uh, get explosives uh, near the Kremlin, and if it was a military drone, it seems uh, unlikely. If it was a civilian drone. commercial chinese drone then maybe it is possible that attack that the attack came from inside russia third one this is this is what the western media is calling false flag uh i don't know what would be the motive of a false flag operation because first it didn't attack civilians it it didn't it didn't even damage the kremlin dome it just you know just landed on the dome it just landed on the dome seems like a false flag but if it if this was a false flag it makes russian government look weak i don't know i don't know if putin wants that i don't uh, considering all the propaganda that that has came from came from the russian government all all these years about putin and how is how is strong man he is all the comics and all his martial arts shows and all that i, I don't know i don't know, uh i don't know if russian government wants to make itself look weak uh so it seems unlikely i don't know I don't know what kind of attack it was. It's hard to tell. Possibilities of impact. Well, the another possibility of attack th- that the Russian air defense allowed the drone to enter deliberately and just deactivated it just before it, you know, detonates on the Kremlin. Um, that that. that seems like it's like a mixture of false flag and air defense failure failure you know uh it it doesn't make sense otherwise uh, i don't know, i don't know why russia would do it because if this was a false flag it was very weak it makes russians look weak Uh, i don't know if russian government wants to look weak possibilities of impact the attempt to make russia weak backfired 
it's more like a pin prick more like a stinging prick you know this wasn't a terrorist attack or anything like that it doesn't look like a terrorist attack it doesn't look like it symbolically hurt russia or it you know just some narrative all that it honestly the attempt to make russia attempt to make russia look weak backfired but the russian retaliation will not come without pop- proper planning russia will not just escalate or oh, the drone came in we must we must attack now no 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 russia will retaliate but in a proper way they they're not just going to we must attack ukraine now we must escalate our attack that's that's not going to happen russia will retaliate but it will re- retaliate properly it will plan properly now many people say this and i'm inclined to agree that such attacks aren't planned in kiev but in washington why would you want to take out a leader of a nuclear powered nation not just any nuclear powered nation the biggest nuclear powered nation the biggest nuclear power why would you want to take out a leader with a drone uh, unless you know the second biggest power tells you yeah we have we got your back don't worry about nuclear weapons um i don't know <laughs> the these attacks they're definitely planned in washington i think i think and i've thought about this since the special military operation turned into partial mobilization putin will do the exact thing to ukraine what he did to chechnya there are three possibilities discussed about future of ukraine first russia will get eastern russian dominated ukraine and rest of ukraine will be in nato this is of course russia's red line and one of the reasons for this war i think this outcome is unlikely second russia and poland will divide ukraine and ukraine will cease to exist this outcome is possible but also unlikely as this will move nato borders east via poland although that has already happened with finland entering nato third russia will keep annexed ukrainian territories and annex further ukrainian territories with odessa and possibly link to transnistria in moldova on the west uh, southwestern side of ukraine rest of ukraine will be an autonomous state inside russia just like chechnya if not just completely annexed into russia so that's the big story now i want to talk about the turkish elections polls indicate erdogan set to lose power Erdogan who leads the AKP party AKP faces Kilig Daroglu I'm just going to refer him as opposition the name is little confusing um I don't know how to pronounce it properly unfortunately I'm sorry I'm, I'll just refer to this guy as opposition leader the opposition leader is head of CHP and is backed by a six party coalition Erdogan has internal problems like high levels of inflation. When Erdogan was elected in early 2000s, he was elected to control high levels of inflation in Turkey. And now Turkey has high level of inflation. And also Turkey has had a deadly earthquake. Some experts say this earthquake was the deadliest in thousand years or so thousand two thousand three thousand years if this and i don't know if that i don't know if that is true but this was extremely deadly earthquake it, it caused a lot of infrastructure damage not just the uh not just population but a lot of infrastructure damage erdogan 
also has external problems with NATO and the West. Erdogan has acted independently to suit the interests of his country and his own political interests, not acting according to the rules-based order. So, why am I talking about this? Well, Turkey matters because of its geographical position. Turkey can block Russia's entry into Mediterranean, Mediterranean and the Balkans. It can limit Russia's navy, which has been one of the strategies of Anglo-Saxons. So, British Empire versus Tsarist Russia, NATO versus Soviet Union, NATO versus the Russian Federation. <coughs> that has been one of the strategies to limit Russian naval expansion. Erdogan is still pro-NATO, but just acted more independently of NATO. Turkey needs NATO to deter Russian ag aggression, potential r Russian ag aggression. And NATO needs Turkey to stop Russian naval expansion. Erdogan also wants Turkey to be a part of EU. Nevertheless, nevertheless the West does not like Erdogan. Turkey was sanctioned by US after its purchase of Russian S-400 missile defense system, air defense systems. Turkey also couldn't purchase American F-35 after F-35 airplanes after this, jet, jet fighters, fighter planes, American F-35 fighter planes. Turkey and US also had their differences over Syria, where Turkey attacked Kurdish fighters who were backed by the US. Turkey also has repeatedly rejected US requests to give Ukraine S-400 air defense system which Turkey acquired from Russia and US opposed it. So his opposition leader is backed by six-party coalition. A coalition government can be manipulated by external powers through one of the political parties in the coalition and can risk destabilization of the coalition government, government if the demands of one of the political parties aren't met. So, a coalition government is a weak government, something many people suspect that US also wants in India with 2024 elections. US wants Indian manpower against China, but doesn't want India to become next China. So anyway, Erdogan's opposition leader will be pro-Western and anti-Russian. Just a little bit. R uh, Turkey has more pro-Russian sentiments in recent years, in 2010s. But still, his opposition leader, if he comes to power and forms a government, that government will be more pro-Western. His opposition leader also said that he wants to revive Turkey's bid into the EU. So basically, he will be more pro-Western than Erdogan ever was. Another crisis that made a lot of headlines recently was the Sudanese crisis. Violence broke out within the Sudanese army and a paramilitary group called Warring fact uh, called the Rapid Supporting Forces, RSF. Previously, the warring factions were allies, united after a massive people power revolution in 2019 to overthrow longtime Sudanese dictator Omar al Bashir. They promised a transition to democracy, but instead, instead toppled the country's transitional civilian government in a second coup in 2021. Since then, they have been at odds over plans for a new transition and the integration of RSF into the regular army. Their fight this month That's my new dog. Female dog. You know what I mean. Uh, she's just barking a lot. So anyway, since 
since the second coup in 2021 the rsf and regular army have been at odds over plans for new transition and the integration of rsf into regular army their fight this month has turned the capital once quiet residential streets into a disaster zone leading up the opposing forces are the sudanese army's general abdel fateh burhan and the rsf's general muhammad hamdan dagalo dagalo better known by his nickname hamedit hamedit hamedti hamedti both served under bashir and played key roles in the counter insurgency that began in sudan's darfur region in 2020, 2003 of course this conflict has a larger geopolitical background a picture is circulating about this on twitter sudan cliff notes august 24 2022 us ambassador appointed to sudan following a 25 year lapse september 28 2022 us ambassador warns sudan against finalizing russian naval base deal November 11, 2022. Blinken urges Sudan to consider US support for ra- the rapid formation of a civilian-led transitional government. December 5, 2022. UN brokers framework agreement between Sudan's military leaders and leading pro-democracy parties. December 7, 2022. Blinken threatens travel ban for Sudanese who endanger framework agreement deal february 12 2023 sudan confirms deal for russian naval base key players lavrov and burhan february 16 2023 biden admin sends 288 million dollars in humanitarian aid to sudan march 9 2023 victoria newland visits sudan to discuss democracy april 8 2023 Conflict escalates between Sudanese armed forces under General Burhan and paramilitary group RSF under Dagalo. April 22, 2023, US evacuates Sudan. So this, once again, this is also about Anglo-Saxons trying to stop Russian naval expansion and power projection. which is also why they have hated russian annexation of crimea because of russian warm water port in sevastopol crimea and also one of the reasons why us supported osama bin laden and mujahideen the predecessors to al qaeda and taliban in soviet afghan war in 1980s so sudan is the latest vic- so sudan is the latest victim of russian anglo saxon geopolitical games Many countries have since evacuated their citizens from Sudan including India, China, many EU nations, Japan, Russia, Saudi Arabia and others. No major headlines from the country after the initial wave of headlines. Let's talk about recent bank failures in the west and western economy. Disclaimer, I'm not a financial expert. I'm just making some observations as a normie. This section is not financial advice. US banks have started failing. Started from Silicon Valley Bank, then Signature Bank, and then First Republic Bank. Of course, US government and their media are telling their citizens that banks are fine. European banks also appear at risk. Recently, the shining example of Switzerland, Credit Suisse, failed. The Swiss Central Bank intervened and make UBS another Swiss, another Swiss bank absorb Credit Suisse. The Deutsche Bank also appears to be at risk. As these foreign as these banks started failing, depositors all over US and foreigners too have started moving their money into banks that are co- that are global systematically important banks or as they are called normally banks that are too big to fail the biggest big beneficiary of this phenomenon appears to be the jp morgan chase bank it took over the assets of first republic bank for comparison 
2008 saw peak in terms of asset size of bank failures that is 373.6 billion dollars that's 373.6 billion dollars with 25 bank failures 2010 saw 157 banks failing in 2023 only 3 banks have failed with combined assets of listen to this 548.5 billion dollars so all of 2008 was 373.6 billion dollars and only 3 banks in 2023 have failed with assets of 548.5 billion dollars and as more depositors move their banks into move their money into banks that are too big to fail more bank failures regional bank failures are likely to follow uh, i couldn't find articles but i remember reading somewhere recently that the federal reserve has raised the the federal reserve that is the central bank of united states has raised the interest rates to the levels of 2006 which led to the great financial crisis of 2008 so us economy appears to be heading into a recession why the rise in interest rates to control inflation many people suspect the federal reserve won't be able to control inflation this time while it pushes us economy into a recession which will lead to stagflation where an economy has both high levels of inflation and a recession so basically two terrible economic problems combined combine that with de-dollarization happening around the west right now around the world right now hard times are coming for the west so into uh, i think this was on zero edge zero hedge that central banks have been recording have been buying record amounts of gold the biggest one was singapore and others were china india and turkey and all the deals that chinese and the indians are making and all other other all the other countries are making to not trade in the us dollar instead to trade with their local currencies and combine the fact that the combine the, that with the fact that they are dumping us dollars from their reserves and instead switching to gold well what happens to all that us dollars it will end up eventually back into the us economy and may possibly lead to hyperinflation like the weimar republic or venezuela or hungary or zimbabwe really west is about to enter real hard times what's 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 the other let's see ai so ai has been in a lot of news recently i've already talked about being ai unfortunately i do not have access to google's bard to compare bard with bing uh, i think marcus brownley made a video about bing ai versus bard and uh, i think bing ai came came out ahead of google's bard um, but afterwards google added an update where bard can use bard can uh, code for people and they made a lot of improvements so i don't know where currently uh, google's a uh, google's bard stacks up against bing ai but more than likely bing ai is ahead well right now i want to talk about events surrounding ai rather than ai itself in march about 1000 technology leaders including elon musk and steve wozniak called for a 6 month moratorium on developing new ai tools powerful than gpt4 goldman sachs research predicted that ai could lead to some 300 million 
layoffs in US and Europe. That's 300 million layoffs in US and Europe. If that is true, imagine the job losses around the world. Google CEO Sundar Pichai admitted he doesn't fully understand aspects of BARD after it taught itself a language it wasn't programmed to learn. <laughs> I mean, where the movie, uh, peop, why, why would pe why would people dismiss fiction about AI as fic just fiction? Is it not sometimes fiction can be a prediction sometimes it it can be a manu manual like 1984 and all, all the other dystopias but why <laughs> why why are why are they doing this v just shut down everything just shut it down shut down everything Burn it, burn it, just burn all the ass. <laughs> and a Google CEO warned society to brace for AI acceleration. He also said there is a need for government regulation of AI. Geoffrey Hinton, a computer scientist called the godfather of artificial intelligence, says it is not inconceivable that AI may develop to a point where it poses a threat to humanity. He quit Google after a decade of working there. In his interview with New York Times, he warned of things like AI-generated content flooding the internet with misinformation, automation disrupting job market, authoritarian leaders can use AI technology to manipulate masses, etc. So, AI will not be another fad like NFTs. AI is here to stay and humanity, humanity is not ready to deal with it. I want to go through some news real quick before I get to the final special topic that I found randomly. Macron talked about EU strategic strategic autonomy. When, after uh, visiting China, he talked about EU having strategic autonomy when it comes to and not be a vassal of United States. It's, uh, Macron said that after a trip to Beijing. And of course, United States was outraged. Uh, But the thing is, as much as Macron or any European leader want strategic autonomy when it comes to China, they're not going to have it as long as NATO exists. As long as NATO exists, they're just basically de dependent on the whims of Washington. That's that's the truth. Afghanistan to join China's BRI. Recently, I think China and Pakistan allow, uh, decided to bring Afghanistan into Chinese Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, but considering how CPEC, the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, has been working or, and not working, to be fair, by working, I mean not working. I, I don't have high hopes for Afghanistan in China's Belt and Road Initiative. But because Afghanistan has been sanctioned so much recently, Afghanistan doesn't really have a choice but to join China's Belt and Road Initiative and hope for the best with the Chinese. That's that's what that's what they can do. Massive lithium reserves discovered in Rajasthan. Potential to meet eighty percent of India's demand. 
So recently, Ra- Rajasthan has disco- uh, massive lithium reserves were discovered in Rajasth- Rajasthan that are potentially bigger than the reserves discovered in Jammu and Kashmir. Uh, India can discover as much as lithium as it wants, but also needs to extract that lithium which is a complicated process and requires a lot of water which is why uh, finding lithium in Rajasthan a desert state basically it's uh, complicated it's problematic a little bit problematic Uh, India also needs to learn to refine that lithium and get expertise in battery production because the only country major power that kind of has a hegemony or monopoly in battery uh, battery production and uh, rare earth minerals lithium refining is china so you can discover those reserves but unless and until you find a way to extract those uh, lithium as well as rare earth minerals and turn those turn them into batteries as long as you cannot do that it's kind of pointless it's better than nothing it's better than certainly better than not having it but india is at least a decade away at best a decade away from being able to compete with China when it comes to battery production. And I think India can do it, sure. And this is a good news. I may not sound that optimistic, but it's just the beginning. That's what I'm saying. It doesn't mean we can become a a lithium superpower, a battery superpower overnight. This thing will take at least a decade to manifest into everyday lives of uh, uh, Indian citizens. What else? <clears throat> Syria re-enters the Arab League. So, in 2011, Syria was banished from Arab League. And I think... Let, let me explain the background a little bit. I have found about two reasons that the West and the Arabs went after Syria and its dictator slash leader. I don't know what I don't know uh, about his government policies. Bashar al-Assad. I don't know. I don't know what his policies are exactly, but there are two reasons that are said to be like the main reasons why the Arabs and the West went after Syria. First one is said to be Russia. So uh, I think the Arabs wanted a pipeline through Syria to Europe and Europeans and particularly Americans wanted Europe to get off of Russian energy, oil, Russian oil and natural gas. And this pipeline was said to be crucial towards that initiative. And Syria refused because uh, Syrian government was friendly towards the Russian government and this move could threaten Russia's business obviously and that was that was said to be the fa- uh, that was said to be the motivation behind this pipeline i think from qatar to syria and to turkey and then into europe i think that was supposed to be the pipeline that was supposed to be the route of, of the pipeline and uh, 
I think Syria refused and that's why the West supposedly funded movements in Syria. I don't know, I don't have any evidence, but that appears to be the case that the West funded those movements that led to the civil war in Syria where a bunch of rebels and ISIS <coughs> ISIS, that is Islamic State of Iraq and Syria tried to overthrow Assad and they failed clearly they failed Assad is still in power and they failed in their efforts well the second reason was said to be Iran that I think uh, Syria was helping Iran uh, with its proxy wars and with its economy and Arabs did, did not want that at the time and that was said to be the other reason. So Russia and Iran were the two reasons allegedly for the West and Arabs to go after Assad and try to overthrow his government and uh, through a civil war and uh, Wagner stepped in Wagner group Russia's Wagner group <coughs> Russia's Wagner group stepped in into Syria to fight those terrorists and Turkey also stepped in to fight the Kurdish fighters in Syria because uh, Turkey has a region in Syria uh, it has a region full of uh, ethnic Kurds K-U-R-D-S Kurds uh, Syria also has them I Iraq has them Iran has them and these ethnic Kurds the land was you can say you can say was divided into Syria uh, Iraq Iran and Turkey and if there was independence of Kurdish Kur, uh, Kurds in one country there could be independence movement in all of the countries because they uh, Turkey Syria Iraq and Iran share borders and where they share borders that's where the Kurd Kurds live in majority Kurd ethnic uh, Kurds are in majority so if one of these countries give independence to Kurds then Kurds can fight for independence in all these countries <coughs> that could end up being problem for all of them that's why Turkey stepped up to fight Kurds in Syria and so anyway this civil war turned into a mess with many different sides like the uh, pro-Assad side in uh, with Russia and I think in Iran too with Iran too there were uh, the rebel side that was pro Western and pro Arab with the rebel fighters and ISIS. Yes, ISIS too was said was said to be pro Western. I don't know. I don't, I don't have any evidence, for, but it was said to be pro Western. The third side was the uh, Kurdish fighters, Kurdish separatists, and the fourth side was Turkey. And just because of all this mess. Perhaps because of all this mess, uh, Assad stayed in power and re recently the Chinese brokered peace deal between Russia, uh, between uh, Saudi Arabia and Iran may have led to uh, may have led to hostilities cooling down in Syria as well. Now only, only faction that does not want Assad in Syria is the Western faction, the American soldiers. That, otherwise, Russians are okay. Russians want it. Iran wants uh, Assad to be in power. Russia wants Assad to be in power. Arabs are okay. 
I think okay now with see uh, Assad in power. The only one who does not want Syria in uh, Assad to be in power in Syria is the West. So basically, Syria has entered the Arab League once again after it was expelled in 2011, and I. I think you can see Americans <clears throat> I think you will see Americans leaving Syria soon because now since Syria is in Arab League and since you know Assad has the backing of Russia and Iran maybe also China uh, maybe I don't know I don't know how deep is the Chinese involvement in all of this but I'm, I suspect they are definitely involved in all of this I think the Arabs will force United States and the West basically out of Syria and they'll have no choice because it's not just the Arabs who will want the West to get out of Syria but also Iranians and Russians and maybe also Chinese So this is the last story. As, uh, I saw this story last night. This is in quantamagazine.org. A mutation turned ants into parasites in one generation. A new genetic study of ant social parasites show how complex sets of features can emerge rapidly and potentially split species. So this was an experiment done by researcher Daniel Cronor uh, on the clonal raider ants, the species Oceribiroi. In the first colony collected, he noticed two ants with strange appearance. They were small like workers, but they also sported small wing birds, which was striking because usually the on, only the ant queens develop wings. What made this even stranger was that the clonal raider ants don't even have queens. In keeping their name, these ants reproduce asexually. The, so all the ants in a colony are nearly perfect genetic clones. They are different. From, uh, so these two ants were different from other clonal radar ants. So he took some specimens, shot some photos for the record, and moved on with his work. A few years later, Cronor, Cronor established a lab at Rockefeller University and set up a colony of clonal radar ants for study. One day, his then doctoral student, Buck Tribal, found a few more of the odd miniature queens in that colony and decided to characterize them. Tribal found that the wings weren't the ants' only unusual characteristics. The strange ants also showed different social behavior, had larger ovaries, and laid twice as many eggs. Using genetic tools, he traced all these changes to a 2.25 million base pair long stretch of DNA. In the ordinary ants, the DNA on each of the two copies of the chromosome 13 was different. But in the miniature queen ants, the two copies were identical. So this is this is a long long article about <laughs> parasitical behavior in ants. Genomic analysis have shown that ant inquiline species have independently evolved dozens of times and nearly all of them parasitize a closely related species that look and behave as ants normally do. For evolutionary biologists that posed a mystery, how could a new species of obligate social parasite evolve from its host species? if their ancestors had lived together in the same nest they would have interbred too easily so this is an article on super genes 
I think this is whole thing is fascinating. They've basically arranged, uh, rearranged the D, uh, uh, chromosomes and Tribal and Kronos work also raises, raises other questions about evolution and development including how a supergene mutation relates to speciation. In Formica ants, ants, <laughs> in the Formica ants, <laughs> the single queen and multi queen colonies don't seem to be splitting into independent lineages. Both forms of the supergene seems, seem to be comfortably maintained as polymorphism within a single species. Fascinating article. And I think that this is where we'll end for today. I finished recording early in the morning today. But a big news, a big event happened in the evening. So I have to talk about it. I must talk about it because I don't I don't want to catch up the news if if I can deliver that news right now I, I will that is the former Prime Minister of Pakistan Imran Khan was arrested and taken into police custody while he was entering Islamabad, Islamabad High Court for hearing in a case So his party immediately called for mass protests and uh, protests are happening across multiple cities and in front of police locations and military locations and he was apparently slapped with more than 100 cases including corruption, terrorism and even blasphemy. Since he was removed from power last April through a parliamentary vote of no confidence. Heightening the risk of national instability is the fact that many of Khan's well placed enemies are top military and intelligence officers. So, why is this important? Why is Pakistan relevant even? Uh, well, let's just say that Pakistan's conditions, economic conditions, are just as bad if not worse than Sri Lanka's conditions last year. We all know what happened in Sri Lanka last year. But Pakistan is also a nuclear weapons state which just complicates these matters and makes the situation far far worse. Uh, Pakistan has also has border disputes with India. Uh, India wants to cap capture and regain the Pakistan occupied Kashmir but on the western side of Pakistan they also have a dispute with Afghanistan where uh, a Pashtun majority which is the Pashtun is the dominant ethnicity of Afghanistan uh, where there are many Pashtun majority regions on the western side of Pakistan near the eastern border of Afghanistan and, pa and Afghanistan wants those Pashtun majority areas in Afghanistan so they want to capture these territories this was some this is one of the few like common perspectives or viewpoints or so, uh, something that the previous Afghan government and current Taliban government agrees and Pakistan has also has like 50 billion dollar investments from China uh, in a project called CPEC. CPEC is like the crown jewel of sorts of the, of the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative and uh, it, it is called CPEC. China-Pakistan Economic Corridor which basically would allow the Chinese direct access to Indian Ocean and therefore be able to be able to circumvent or 
the avoid confrontation with american military in the east asian and southeast asia american navy to be more specific and they'll get direct access to indian ocean because they buy most of their energy from gulf nations in the uh, from the arab countries and and iran and they have to go all the way from uh, indian subcontinent and in the indian ocean then southeast asia then to east asia and indian navy and american navy can just cut off access of energy and hydrocarbons basically to the chinese that's why they are trying to circumvent this and shorten their trade route with the uh, cpec and uh, if, if you are familiar with pakistan's history you if you are not following or if you are not uh, obeying or following pakistani military then you are not then you will get ousted you will get executed by their military and same appears to have happened with imran khan imran khan probably got, was elected with the support of pakistani military and uh, he went against them, them afterwards in his later terms and and he was ousted with a no confidence vote in parliament last year soon after india refused to sanction russia so if you if you know geopolitics what pakistan is to india is basically what eastern europe is to russia or taiwan is to china for example it's it allows certain powers to meddle in the, in the sphere of influence of india and uh, basically the west and the chinese and therefore pakistan is important uh, for the west and the chinese and after india refused to sanction russia last year uh, imran khan's government fell with a no confidence vote in the parliament and soon afterwards pakistan received 450 million dollars to repair their f16s and they were given that money by united states and uh, and they were also removed from fatf gray list this is basically economic uh, trading tra- uh, g- gray list <laughs> gray list uh, <laughs> uh, which pakistan was in and suddenly it got out last year even though they haven't changed their economic or trade policies not by much but still they got out last year why were they put in the gray list if they haven't changed anything why were they put in the gray list in the first place and if they were put in the gray list for doing bad stuff for pursuing bad trade policies they haven't changed those policies why did they get out it's if you know it's obvious to uh, to it's just to you know cause trouble in india and make sure india doesn't expand into indian ocean for example to keep india busy in the indian subcontinent only that's the goal and so he was ousted last year and soon there were reports of his upcoming arrest so it this was inevitable this was going to happen and this has happened right now uh, right now as in today and he has a lot of supporters and pakistani people know that their country is basically controlled by their military and they are tired of it and 
so this is basically a civilian faction versus military faction establishment faction this could according to many experts descend into a civil war and there already protesters are pr protesting against the army and the police and this could escalate into a civil war and considering the territorial disputes with uh, Afghanistan, considering China's Belt and Road Initiative, considering uh, border dispute with India, and considering the fact that Pakistan is a nuclear weapon state, worst case th scenario, things get really, really bad in Pakistan and therefore in Asia, in South Asia, or uh, South Asia as they call it, which is basically Indian subcontinent. So this was, this is the latest news and cut. Thank you so much for tuning in and I'll see you guys very, very soon.